Hebrews 12, verse 2, the Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For, consider him, that endured such contradiction of sinners, against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We're looking this morning and for the next several weeks on this thought and this topic. Consider Christ. Consider Christ. We're going to see different things that we consider, whether it be his presence, his omniscience, Different attributes. We're also going to look and consider different actions of His. Consider Christ. As we begin this morning, let's ask God's blessing as we get into the message. Lord, we come to you now asking you to speak to our hearts. Those of us who are here, the, the children next door, those watching online, give us what we need from your word. It's so applicable today. It's quick and powerful. It means it's alive and effective for right now. Would you help us, please? Would you speak to our hearts, please? In Jesus' name, amen. Our minds are constantly considering choices, opportunities, people, events, uh, responsibilities, more. I hesitate to say this because I don't want your mind on it, but some are considering what's for lunch this afternoon, right? <laughs> and what we're going to do here. Some are considering which team to cheer for as the NBA playoffs start tomorrow. There's no consideration needed to be made. Just cheer for the Lakers and everything will be good. And some of you are like, whoa, we need, to, we need a new pastor now. I'm on Lakers <laughs> fans. All right. Uh, whether we're considering, some of you are, are considering, uh, some just got a new job. Some are perhaps get a new job this week, considering opportunities for that. And voices from every direction call us to consider a message. Maybe it's an advertisement on a commercial. Think about this. Though those commercials are crazy. As soon as you get something new, maybe you get the newest phone. And it's not but two days later. You don't have the newest one anymore. Consider that you need this. Or you've got a nice car, but consider what this car could give you. Or consider what these clothes can do. Social media, friends, family even, they call us to consider. Give me a little bit of space in your mind is what it's saying. Give me a moment of your attention. Now that we are in a presidential election year, we're going to be called to consider many things. Uh, back before the, the Democratic Party narrowed it down to, to one candidate, there are many different candidates this year that we heard from, and they're asking us to consider their policies or their past records, consider their running mates, consider anything that will cause you to vote for me, right? Through television, radio, internet, engage with us, asking us to consider them. We all consider things throughout each day. And while there are many people and many causes to consider, the sad thing is this. There's one who easily gets crowded out of our everyday thoughts, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Of all the things that you've considered this past week, may I get you to think about this? Have you considered Christ? Have you considered him, verse number 3, specifically tells us, for consider Him. Consider Him. So that's what we're going to do this series. So what we're going to do this morning. Look at, at different attributes, looking at different actions. And, and what's amazing, what you'll find, watch this. When you take time to consider Christ, you'll find a renewed energy. You'll find a strength that the world can't give you. You'll find a joy that comes from Jesus just taking time to consider Him. Today, we're just going to specifically look at His person. Who is Jesus? Consider Christ. Number one, I want us to consider His position. Consider His position. If I were to give each of you a piece of paper this morning and a pen, 
And I was to say, write down who you believe God is. Who is God? Who is Jesus? May I ask, I want you to think about how much would you be able to write? Would you be able to fill up the page? The back page? Tragically, the sad reality is most Americans would not be able to write much because we haven't really considered who Jesus is. We may know a little bit about God, but as far as Him impacting our everyday, day-to-day -day choices and decisions, we don't consider Him. If I were to ask you some things that you know about, we all have our different hobbies, different interests, different things that, that gain our attention and things that we like, and those are good things. And we could probably fill up a page about, I mentioned earlier, I'm a sports fan. I could write a lot about sports and my favorite sports teams. Uh, some of you could write a lot about cars or, or you could write about uh, a lot about this or a lot about that. And that's, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm asking us, though, to take a few moments and consider Christ. May we not allow our lives to be more consumed with the things of the world than by the truths of God's word. And by the way, if you want to get a good look at who Jesus is, open that book in your lap. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the more our minds can be uh, consumed with the truth of God's Word rather than the things of this world, the more we can consider Christ, the more strength, the more joy, the more grace we'll have each day. Consider His position. Well, who, what is His position according to this passage? Well, I see first of all, He's the preeminent one. Look in verse number 2. It says, looking unto Jesus... The author and finisher of our faith. He is the preeminent one. Preeminent means the one above all. It's not just first in rank. It is superior and first in rank. But it's first and as if there are no other. First and only. He's the preeminent one. He's the author. That word author means he's the originator of our faith. He's the first and the last. Colossians 1, listen to these verses. Verse 16 to 18 say, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist, and He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Revelation 1 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. All throughout Scripture, we see different names for God that all point to the fact that He is the preeminent one. Now, hold on a minute. If I were to ask who agrees with that, I believe everybody in here would shake their head. Yep, He's the preeminent one. I believe it because of what the Bible says. But rather than thinking about how he's preeminent in this world, I want you to consider, is he preeminent in your life? It's not about a head knowledge of who we know that Jesus and God is. It's about considering him. Is he preeminent in my life? Does he top my thoughts? Is he superior in rank when I consider the day? Is he the preeminent one? According to this passage, he's the author, the originator of our faith. But then it also says not only is he the preeminent one, but he's also the perfect one. Verse 2 says, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That finisher has the idea of the one who completes, the one who perfects our faith. He finishes it. He's the one who will bring our faith to its completion. To its fullest development. Philippians 1 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. You say, I don't, I don't get it. What do you mean, the fullest of my faith? Let me explain it this way. The moment that you and I got saved, the moment you asked Jesus to come and take a residence in your heart, to forgive you of your sins, to take you to heaven when you die, when you did that, 
the Holy Spirit came and lived inside of you. And He begins working in your life and in my life. Here's what He's doing. He's making us more like Christ. That process, by the way, is not a one-time thing. You don't get saved and immediately get perfect. Uh, I, I, was, I was sharing this with someone yesterday. We had someone uh, trust Christ as Savior at, at, at the uh, memorial service yesterday. And sharing the fact that I trusted Christ as a four-year-old. That doesn't mean for the last 31 years I've been perfect. Oh, no. But it means that the Holy Spirit's working in my life to get me to become more like Christ. That's sanctification. And as that process continues to develop and as that process continues to grow in our faith, it's this process that perfects or completes us. And one day we will be made like Christ. So we've got the moment of salvation, justification. We've got the moment that we're in heaven, glorification. These are one-time things. But all this process in between is a process of sanctification. May I ask you to consider this? Are you more like Christ today than you were last year? Or last month? Or ten years ago? Because the Holy Spirit's job, watch this, at the moment of salvation is to begin, get you to become more and more like Christ each and every day. He's the perfecter, the finisher, the completer of our faith. He is, he's perfect. How, how can we trust Him though? How can we trust Jesus and his position as the perfect one to complete our faith, to make us more like Christ. I believe there's two reasons we can trust him as the perfect one. Number one, his ways are perfect. His ways are perfect. I'll be honest with you this morning. I'll be the first to tell you. I don't always understand Christ's ways and what he's doing and how he's working. I don't always understand when this happens and what's the answer. Pastor, can you tell me why? Most of the time, I can't. But I can tell you this. We can have confidence when we consider His position as the perfect one, that His ways are perfect. He often uses trials. He often uses testing to do what? To perfect us. And see, we may be doubted at that time to... Doubt, or maybe tempted to doubt his love at that time, and tempted to doubt God's goodness. But rather than doubt, which is what the devil wants you to do, if you and I can just take a few moments and begin to consider Christ and his position as the perfect one, we'll realize his ways are perfect. He knows what he's doing. Deuteronomy 32 4, he is the rock, his work is perfect. Psalm 18, verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried as a buckler to all those that trust in him. For who is God? Save the Lord. Or who is a rock? Save our God. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. We can trust him when we consider Christ. He's the preeminent one. He's the perfect one. His ways are are perfect. May I encourage you to take a moment just to consider how comforting it is that His ways are perfect. You see, there's so much of the Bible and so much of God that I believe so much of us know. But to make it personal and to apply it to our situation is the difficult thing sometimes. I know God's ways are perfect. I just don't like it. Right? I just don't want it to be this way. We can take comfort when we consider Christ. His ways are perfect, but not only His ways are perfect, His work is perfect. Why don't you consider His life? You know, He's already run the race, the race of faith. He's already run it, and He's already won it. He's won it for us. He was tempted in every way, but He never sinned. We're going to look at that in a moment. He's our perfect example. He's not one that says, do as I say, not as I did. He's our perfect example. His work was perfect. And that's one reason we must consider Christ. Ephesians 4.13 Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's it telling us? We need to get to a point where our faith is completed and perfect. And that measures up to Jesus Christ. We'll get there one day in heaven. 
My dad often said, I want to live as much like Christ today, so when I get to heaven, there doesn't have to be much of a change. I just want to be like Christ, live like Christ, understand His work is perfect. He's working, watch this, to bring His will into your life. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm stubborn. And the way He wants to work, I don't want Him to work. And the way He wants to do, I fight against. Over and over. And He's just working to bring His will into our life. Sometimes we make it harder. His work will continue until our race is finished and we're with Him in glory. He has the power, He has the authority to do this work in you because He's perfect, because He's preeminent. Consider His position. I encourage you this week. We're going to go on to another one in just a moment. But just this week, consider His position in your life. Take comfort in knowing. Take the challenge that He's the preeminent one. Take comfort that He's the perfect one. His ways, His work are perfect. Consider His position. But number two, consider His pattern. You see in our text, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, notice, endured the despising the shame. His pattern, he endured the cross and despised the shame. What we see looking at his ministry and looking at his life, that he lived a pattern of walking in victory. He had victory over temptation. He had victory over trials. Let's look at a couple of these for just a moment. He had victory over temptation. This is not something any of you would say, wow, that's new. I never thought about this. But at the moment you want to do something for God, the devil takes notice. The devil's going to tempt you to get you away from doing what God wants you to do. You say, the devil's not tempting me. You might be on his side. Just, that just may be something to consider. If he's not actively working against you, that may show us something else in our lives that we need to consider else. He's going to tempt you. So how do we overcome those temptations? Well, let's consider his pattern. We've considered... We can see a synopsis of his pattern in Matthew 4. Not only did he win the victory over temptation, not only could he not sin, but he shows the pattern for our endurance, our resistance to temptation. Notice what happens in Matthew 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 49 days, I can only imagine how hungry and weak physically Jesus is at this time. By the way, that's when the devil's going to attack you. Look right here for just a moment. This is free. This has nothing to do with our message this morning. Never make a big decision when you're tired, when you're weak. The devil's getting after you at that time. Don't make any big decision at that time. Verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh them up into the holy city, setteth them on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Did you catch verse 6, by the way? Did you catch that the devil knows scripture? Do you see what he just said? The devil said, do this. Didn't you say this in your book? Huh. Be careful. The devil's a master tempter. You ever told a child sometimes or, or a young person or a teenager, hey, I've been around the block a few times. I know what's going to happen. Understand this, right? You, you have life experience. Can you imagine 6,000 years of experience? And yet we think we can face the devil? He's got experience after experience after experience after experience. He knows the Bible. He's against it. And he's trying to get you away from it. Just like he was with Jesus. Verse 7, Jesus, that was free too. We've got a lot of free stuff today. <laughs> Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt be God. 
Again, the devil taking them up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Give thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. We have Jesus at perhaps one of his weakest points physically, tempted of the devil three times. And he overcame that temptation and won the victory over that temptation. Watch this. If Satan had the audacity to go after Jesus Christ, what makes us think he's not going to come after us? He will come after us. So you say, I'm not Jesus. I'm not God. I can't overcome this temptation. Well, let's take a moment and consider his pattern of the victory over temptation. What was his pattern? Look in verse number one. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit. The first thing I see with his victory over temptation, watch this, he was led by the Spirit. When Jesus went to the wilderness, it was under the direction of the Spirit of God. Watch this, as a child of God, you and I must be filled with, walk in, guided by, and led of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living inside of you if you're a child of God. He's not just there as your insurance, as your fire insurance. You know, from hell. He's not just there sealing you to the day of temptation when he'll take you to heaven. That's not his only purpose. It's to guide you. It's to give us direction. It's to help us. But he won't force himself upon us. I would love for him to say, no, you're doing this whether you want to or not. I'd, want, I'd love for that to happen. But here's what you got inside. you got the spirit and you got the flesh. The Bible says these are contrary to one or the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. You can't serve both. Whichever one you feed the most is the one that's going to win. And I'm not talking about lunchtime feeding. I'm talking about doing what we want, spiritually side of the carnal side of our, our flesh, or doing what Christ wants. Galatians 5.16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if we're going to consider Christ, we've got to be led of the Spirit. That's what Jesus was. What else was He? Look at verse number 2. And when He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Watch this pattern. You need victory over temptation? Number 1, be led of the Spirit. Number 2, pray and fast. You know, throughout Scripture we can see different verses where Jesus said, This kind cometh not forth but by prayer and fasting. Jesus' physical body was weak. He was 100% man. But hold on. How was he powerful enough to defeat Satan at his weakest time? I believe there was a closeness now to the Father. I believe there was great strength spiritually from his praying and fasting. He just got close to God. One day a pastor told his family... I'm going to be praying and fasting for a certain need. Got a five-year-old daughter, little Jenny. Jenny understood a little bit about fasting and, and immediately spoke up to her dad. No, dad, you can't do that. You'll die if you fast. And her father calmly tried to explain. Look, many women, men in the Bible uh, have, have fasted. And Jenny thought for just a moment and looked back up at her dad and said, Yes, dad. And they're all dead. <laughs> so we're, I'm not saying, and I don't believe the Bible teaches us to fast to the point where we physically destroy our bodies. But hold on. You fast for a meal, you're going to be like, my body didn't like that. I, I'm just not able to do that. Hold on. Of course your body didn't like that. You fast for a day, it's difficult. But... There are certain answers to prayer the Bible teaches that only come when we come to the Lord earnestly. Is it worth more to you than other things? The truth of the matter is this. I want us to understand this. Praying is not about getting a hold of the answer. I don't know what to do. I've got to get a hold of the answer. That's not what prayer really is. Prayer is about getting a hold of God. 
And as we pray and as we fast and, and we bring this before God and God, I don't understand it. And I want you more than I want anything else. I just want to be close to you. I need victory in this scenario. I need help and I can't overcome this. What's considered his pattern? He was led of the spirit. He prayed and fasted and then look in verse number three. What else did he do? When the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written. He was led of the spirit. He prayed and fasted. Watch this. He quoted scripture. He quoted scripture. As Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus quoted God's word right back to Satan. There is no victory over temptation apart from the power of God's word. Ephesians 6, 17 says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So when you and I are faced with temptations, watch this. Let's consider Christ. What was, what was his pattern? How, how did he win the victory over temptation? He quoted scripture. Many of you, if not all of us, face certain temptations that are harder for us to fight than others. There are some temptations in here that some of us, no problem. Other of us, great struggle. Some of you have shared these things. We pray about these things. How do we get the victory? Find scripture. Find scripture that deals with what you are struggling with. Commit it to memory. Maybe you're dealing with worry. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Maybe you're dealing with, with what you see. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Psalm 119, 9, wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That I might not sin against thee. Maybe you're dealing with anger. A soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither your place to the devil. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. I don't know what your struggle is. Watch this. But the Bible has the answer. Can I encourage you? Find some scripture. I can help you find some scripture and commit it to memory. Why? Well, we're considering his pattern. How did he win the victory over temptation? Love of the spirit, prayer and fasting, quoting scripture. He had victory over temptation. But this passage in our text also shows he has victory over trials. It says he endured such contradiction of sinners. Against himself. A trial is something that, that God brings into your life. And not necessarily something wrong. Not a temptation or a sin. It's just a difficulty you've got to go through. Jesus won the victory over trials as well. When the process. There are times when the process. Watch this. Of enduring. Is the very work that God uses to purify your faith. What you're having to go through right now. May be something exactly what God is using to purify your faith. To chip away at some things that don't need to be there. To strengthen what does need to be there. And your endurance is God's way of bringing you to maturity. Of making you perfect, complete. James 1. I don't like these verses. But I memorized them when I was in fourth grade. James chapter 1. I had a teacher. His name was Tim Cram. I, I still remember it. I memorized the whole chapter. I think it was 27, 29 verses. And I got a box of Whoppers. <laughs> At that time, that was wonderful. At this time, I'm rethinking that. Come on, that was a lot of work. I might have gotten $20 now that I think about it with it. I don't remember. But anyway, James 1 verse number 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh something that I don't want. <laughs> patience. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire Wanting nothing. God wants us to endure just like Jesus did. Watch this. If you and I quit in the middle of a trial, you're quitting at something that perfects your faith. You're going to miss out on the lesson of what God wants to teach us. So consider His pattern. 
This victory over temptation. This victory over trial. Consider his position. He's the preeminent one. He's the perfect one. But I want us lastly, and we'll finish with this. Consider his passion. What moved him? What was his passion? It says, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, how did he endure the cross? How did he despise the shame? Shame is something that none of us want. None of us want to be embarrassed or shamed or this. And he despised that. He endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. When I think about that, I think we're going to find out what that passion was. It was something that enabled him to go to the cross. To leave heaven doesn't sound appealing to me. And yet he did. To go to a cross doesn't sound attractive to me. And yet he did. It was painful. There would be great difficulty. There would be great sorrow that came to his life as he bare the sins of the world. So what made him step from heaven's throne and become a servant? What made him put on flesh and die for the sins of the world? What was his passion. Let's consider it for a moment. Turn if you would to John 17. We're almost finished. This is so important for us to catch. The book of John only covers 11 to 17 days of Christ's life. It's not a synoptic gospel like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It, covers, it just covers a few certain days. John 17 is his prayer before he goes to the cross. I want you to consider his passion. We're going to read those verses in just a moment. Look right up here. I believe his first and foremost passion was this. To glorify God. He lived to glorify God. That was greater than anything that would try to stop him from enduring the cross. The joy that was set before him was... Doing what glorifies God. Bringing glory to the Father. His whole purpose was to glorify God. If you think about it, as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And then what did he say? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It's not about what I want. God, I just want to glorify you. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. His passion was to glorify His Father. John 17 verse 1 says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify Thy Son, that Thy Son also may glorify Thee. As Thou hast given Him power over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as Thou hast given Him. And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. I have glorified Thee on the earth. I finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. With the glory which I had with thee before the world was. As you consider Christ this week. Consider his passion. He lived to bring glory to God. Bring honor to God. Bring honor to Jesus Christ this week with your life. Let that be your passion. But his passion was not just to glorify the Father. I believe second of all was this. Was to redeem the world from sin. To redeem the world from sin. That was his passion. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Looking unto Jesus, our text says, The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That portion, that phrase, who for the joy that was set before him. Christ was appointed to do this task. It wasn't just something that fell in his lap. It was a job given to him, given to, him to do. The Lord came to this earth to redeem the world. It was a plan set in motion from eternity past. A plan of God's love. It was his task. To redeem the world from sin. And it was his passion to give man 
the hope of salvation. He had a plan that Jesus, God had a plan that Jesus carried out. And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son to be born of a virgin, died for our sin on the cross, lived a sinless life, rose again the third day, now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I love that part in, in, in the end of our text in verse number 2. Is set, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Watch that. Watch this. When someone's seated, that means the work's completed. If he was standing at the right hand of God, there's something more to do. He's not standing. He's sitting. He's sitting in God because the work is finished. He's accomplished his passion. His passion was to glorify God and redeem mankind. And that's what he did. It's God's will that you be saved. That I be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. I've, I've told this story before. A young boy named Tom who, who crafted his own little boat. Painted it. Uh, had little things on it. Just was so proud of his finished product. And every chance he had, he sailed that boat on a little puddle. Or a creek. Or a river. Anything he could. One day he took that boat to the edge of a river. Had a string carefully placed it in the water. He sat there in pure joy as he watched his boat that he had made sail gracefully on the stream until a little current caught it, took the string right out of his hands. To his dismay, he tried to rescue it, but the current was too strong. He ran on the shore as fast as he could, but couldn't keep up with his boat. Finally accepted the fact that he wouldn't get his boat back. So he returned home, trying not to cry. It wasn't but a week later, he's in town, and as he's walking by, he notices something in the window of the store. It looked exactly like his boat. So he had to run inside, get a better look at, at his boat, and after just a few glances, he realized, that's my boat. He ran to the manager of the store, he said, sir, you see that boat? That, that's mine, I, I made it, I lost it, can I please have it back? The store manager said, sorry, son, I mean, if you want the boat... You need to pay the dollar for it. So he went home. Didn't have a dollar. Started working. Trying to earn this money. Finally got enough. So excited. He'd get back to the store as fast as he could. Hoping the boat would still be there. And it was. Sure enough. Ran to the counter. Gave the money for the boat. Got the boat back in his hands. Gave it a tight hug. Looked at the boat and said this. Now you're mine. Twice. Once. Because I made you. But twice, because I brought you. Understand today, you and I are Christ. First, because He made us. But if you're a child of God this morning and you trusted in His payment on the cross, you're His twice because He bought you again. If you're saved today, may I ask you, do you share His passion to glorify God with your life? Do you share his passion to redeem the lost? Oh, it's not something you can do, but it's something you can tell others of. That Jesus came to save them from their sin. Are you telling others? Do you share that same passion? So this week, you'll have many things calling for your attention, undoubtedly. Family, finances, friends, career, relationship. Struggles calling for your attention. And as you consider the various decisions and opportunities and needs and anything else, may I ask you, first and foremost, to consider Christ. His position. He's God. He, he must be preeminent. All His ways, all His works are perfect. I can trust Him. Consider His pattern. Let's be led of the Spirit. Uh, let's, let's pray and fast. Let's quote scripture to endure trials and consider his passion. Let's glorify the Father and let's tell others of his redemptive work. Let's bow our heads and hearts together for prayer this morning. Thank you for listening.